Good. So, uh, yes, my name is Claire Bowler, and uh, I'm from Papua New Guinea, which is a small country, low income country. Bangladesh is a middle income country. And uh, we are only 10 million people. I think Dhaka is uh, 20 million people. 20 million people, Dhaka. Almost, thank you. So we are only half the size of Dhaka. Uh, but Mike, uh, uh, you can't hear me. Uh, when there's no scar in the uterus, it's possible to mostly be normal. I've spent two days at the Eshwa One One. I think it's called. Sarawak Clinic. Uh, big. It's a big uh, public hospital, built of beautiful brick. Looks like the Parliament. <laughs> yes, we had, we had. I think it was uh, 16 births in the two days, only eight per day. We did one cesarean section. Small cut on the head of the baby. Little bit of pull. She delivers the baby. No need for major surgery, and particularly. No need for major surgery of the, to the difficult, risky caesarean section of full dilatation <coughs> caesarean section. So I'd just like to take you through a few. Canada, New Zealand, Australia, UK, England and Wales, Sweden, we're aspiring be like the best. These are the countries in the world with the best healthcare. There's no doubt about that. The National Health Service in the UK is probably the best health service in the world. So, what do they do? This is a table of assisted vaginal delivery in these countries. Canada. 16% of births are assisted vaginal deliveries. One out of every eight in the UK, you can see England and Wales, 10%. One out of every 10 births is assisted vaginally. But in Bangladesh, less than 1%. If we are aspiring to be the best, we need to be more like this. And not just doing cesarean sections that are not necessary, which will lead to problems in the woman's future. Next. I think we'll leave that one, because uh, I don't want to spend more than 20 minutes. OK. Next. 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 Thank you. So, if you do a cesarean section, there are immediate risks and there are long-term risks. There's a series in The Lancet last year on cesarean section. There are three papers in the series. First paper is on the epidemiology of cesarean section in the world. Second paper is on the short-term and long-term risks. I'm one of the authors of this paper. That's the reference down at the bottom there. Short and long-term effects of cesarean section. There are serious problems, both short-term and long-term, from cesarean section. It's not a procedure we should be doing for no good reason. Next. Next. Technology is slow. OK. So the immediate risks. And ascetic risks. You have to give quite a serious anesthetic to someone having a caesarean section. The spinal is good, the least risky of the options, but still, there are problems. Then there's the surgical issues. You always lose more blood when you have a caesarean birth than if you have a vaginal birth. PPH is the commonest cause of death worldwide for mothers having babies. So 
you will have problems. And the MMR, the maternal mortality ratio will go up if you do more cesarean births, especially if they're the dangerous ones, like second stage ones and repeat ones. Next. The long-term problems. After cesarean section, fertility is reduced because of pelvic adhesions. Something you can't avoid. And the more chance of infection in the pelvis, like second stage cesarean sections, the more chance of pelvic adhesions. A young woman having the first baby, the last thing she wants, and her mother-in-law certainly does not want reduced fertility. Many mothers-in-law are pressurizing doctors to do cesarean sections. You should tell them. It will reduce the fertility. It's not a good idea unless it is necessary. <coughs> and then the attitude. There is a long-term effect on the woman's mind. If she's had a long labor and a long second stage, and instead of just pulling the baby out, you take her to the operating theater, you put a little injection into the CSF, the pain disappears like that. One minute, the pain has gone. And she thinks it's magical. And sometimes in the next pregnancy, she thinks, I will just have that needle, please, and no pain. And doctor will give a cesarean section because I will ask for it. That's not a good idea. And the opposite attitude sometimes. She thinks, I am a normal woman. I can deliver my baby, but doctor cut me for nothing. So she comes to the labor ward, two hours of pain. Doctor sees a little bit of meconium. So next time, I won't go to that hospital. I'll have the baby in the house uterus ruptures and she dies because of the scar in her uterus. <coughs> the cesarean section needs to be necessary and when you do it you need to counsel very carefully about why you did it and what you, the woman should do next time <coughs> in the pregnancy. And the scar is for the rest of her life. You put the scar in her uterus for the first baby, she has that scar for the rest of her life. You can never make that uterus normal again. So every pregnancy now is a risk, a bigger risk. And the one we fear, even in Western countries, even in high income countries, Women can die from that last one. Abnormal placentation. Abnormal attachment of the placenta in the uterus. And the more cesareans you do, the more risk there is of abnormal placentation. Next. Next. So this is a forest plot of a meta-analysis on numbers of cesarean sections and problems particularly risk of placenta previa. Now you can't read all the um, research uh, references, but it's clear that the black dots are on this side, not on this side. So cesarean does not prevent placenta previa for anybody, and it increases the risk of placenta previa for everybody. And the more cesareans you have, at the top is one cesarean section, so a little bit of placenta previa increased. And then in the middle is two previous cesarean sections, so it's higher. And down the bottom are the women with three previous cesarean sections, where the increased risk of placenta previa is about 30-something percent. Placenta previa, when you've had a previous cesarean section, is not just like a normal placenta previa, especially if it's on the anterior wall 
and it's attached to the scar, that's what leads to accreta. In other words, it's, it's attached to scar, not attached to decidua or the endometrial normal tissue, and then you can't separate it. And then she bleeds torrentially, and then you have to do a hysterectomy, and if it's penetrating through the scar, that's called increta or percreta, then even if you do the hysterectomy, she still dies in most circumstances. The next shows you, next shows you, meta-analysis is 2.3 million births, so it's a lot of data, and you can see at the top there, risk of placenta previa, no previous cesarean sections, very few percent of previous, and they're not particularly dangerous either because they're not on scars. But once you've had one previous cesarean section, the risk has increased to at least 1% and nearly 3% when you've had three previous cesarean sections. But worse is if it's previa in the next pregnancy, virtually no risk of accreta or percreta. But once you've had one previous caesarean section, the risk of accreta or percreta has reached 3%. But the really scary one is once you've had three previous caesarean sections and your placenta is on the scar, the chance of accreta or percreta is now 50%. That's what women need to be counseled about when they're thinking about having an unnecessary cesarean section. Your children may have no mother. And yeah, the risk of TH, the risk of hysterectomy is also increasing. This is the same data that's just put on a histogram, so it's more visual. And you can see after the third cesarean section, the risk of accreta is going up exponentially. Now, I'm not going to dwell on this for too long because most of you are not ONG specialists <coughs> and this is getting a bit technical, but when you have an increta or percreta placenta on a previous caesarean section scar, you're going to need vascular surgeons, oncology surgeons, uh, 20 units of blood in the blood bank, and she still might die. <coughs> through the next screen, next screen. Yeah, that's the accretors when you've had a previous season. Next one, it's all going up exponentially. Next one, and the hysterectomies. No, women don't want to lose their uterus, but they will. And the problem is that first cesarean <coughs> section, which is so easy and simple, is leading to the second one, and the second one is leading to the third one. That is the problem. Now, in most high-income countries, women are only having one baby. That's different to us. Most women want two or three. Some even want four. And that's the problem. So, just a couple of words about the other issue of PPH. PPH is the commonest cause of maternal mortality in the UK and Bangladesh and PNG, everywhere. The numbers are different, but the proportion is the same. About 30% of maternal mortality is hemorrhage. The, the, the most Close association for risk of PPH is duration of labor, <coughs> especially duration of the second stage of labor. The longer the second stage, the more likely you are to have, lose more blood with your delivery. Whether you have a Caesar or a vaginal birth, the Caesar doesn't protect you against PPH. In fact, there is more blood loss when you have a Caesar. If your uterus doesn't contract, if you have an atonic uterus, it will be atonic at Caesar or atonic at vaginal birth, the same. You'll just lose more blood 
if it's atonic at Caesar, because you're bleeding from more places. You're bleeding from the wound as well as from the um, cavity of the uterus. The vacuum extractor can reduce the duration of the second stage. She's pushing for one hour. You can help her deliver the baby very simply without cutting the uterus. If you just let her push for two hours, three hours, and then you do a Caesar, that's the one who's likely to die from PPH. So vacuum extractor saves women's lives from PPH by keeping the second stage at a reasonable length. The second commonest cause of maternal mortality is sepsis. When you're in the second stage, there's always infection inside your unit. Some bacteria are in there. Your membranes have been ruptured for a long time. Many fingers have gone inside to check you. We put on the sterile glove, but we touch the perineum. We touch the vulva as we go inside to check. The vulva and the perineum are not sterile. So we're always taking a few, well, quite a few, probably a couple of million, coliforms inside every time we examine the woman. So if we cut that uterus, we're cutting into an infected area. So the Caesar wound is likely to get infected and not heal well or she might have a secondary PPH from an infected Caesar wound, or the infection can go into the peritoneal cavity and she can have serious sepsis with abscess formation, septicemia, even septic shock and die. But if you put the vacuum extractor on and deliver the baby, the infection is only in the cavity and four or five days of antibiotics and she's fine. So vacuum extraction, also prevents death from sepsis. Next. Next, we miss out the anaesthetists. I'm sure the anaesthesia is here as ready. Well, next one. Because the scar, I've already talked about the scar. We can move off that one. Next, next, next. next one. So I want to get on to the baby. <coughs> next one. Okay. So vacuum extraction also saves babies' lives. The longer the second stage, the more hypoxic the baby is becoming. And the commonest cause of neonatal death is birth asphyxia. So if you have a protocol that limits the second stage to one hour, say for a primary gravida, 30 minutes for a multipara, which is a reasonable time for a normal woman to push out her baby if the contractions are good, then there'll be much less birth asphyxia. So she's pushing for one hour, she can't quite get it out, you put the cup on the head, you do a little bit of a pull, out it comes, it's in better condition. So that's why vacuum extraction saves mother's lives and saves babies' lives. Now, I hear at this institution, most of the obstetric cases are referred. If you have referred cases, you should still think, can I deliver this baby normally? Many of the referrals, I think, will be for poor contractions. The commonest reason for delay in labor for a primary gravida particularly is ineffective uterine contractions. So a simple way to solve that problem is an oxytocin infusion and perhaps a vacuum extraction in the second stage, not just a caesarean section. When I go to hospitals all over Dhaka and I say, oh, your caesarean section rate is very high, and they, oh, yes, Prof. Mola, yes, of course, because we have referred patients. Yes? Yes? But referral doesn't equal caesarean section. Referral equals proper assessment and tailored management according to the needs of the problem. 
that the woman has been referred with, I would suggest it's usually not cesarean section if your cases are being referred from primary care or even secondary care facilities by staff who are not obstetricians. So I'd like to stop there and uh, please feel free to ask any questions. So we can easily pull the baby out with the vacuum extractor. Especially when we put the vacuum extractor on the flexion point. That is the important thing. You must put the vacuum extractor on the flexion point so when you pull, you flex the baby's head and the diameters get smaller. It's not useful to use these kind of vacuum extractors like this because you can't put them on the flexion point. All you can do is just put them on what you can see. And you'll end up on the caput and not the flexion point and your vacuum extraction will fail. Modern vacuum extraction needs a cut that you can put on the flexion point. So you can put it there, 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 for a posterior position. And once you've got it on the flexion point, then you can flex the baby's head. This is a posterior position. You can see baby's looking at me. It's meant to be around this way when it's coming out. But this is a posterior position. And when you flex the baby's head and then you pull, it rotates uh, automatically or auto-rotates and descends and delivers. So this is a much better instrument than forceps. With forceps, you can only pull. And you can only put them on anterior positions. And you can only put them when it's quite low in the pelvis. This one, you can put it on anterior, posterior, transverse, <coughs> anywhere. As long as you can reach the flexion point, then you'll flex the baby's head, diameters get smaller, traction now causes descent and auto-rotation and delivery. So I'd like to recommend this to anyone who's interested in reducing unnecessary caesarean sections. Carried out uh, vacuum extraction here. And what is the now part actually to perform here? Okay. So I told you I went to the Mahamudpur Fertility Training and Service Centre Hospital for the first three days, and we did the we dealt with the 30 women who came with pain, and we did four vacuum extractions out of 30, and two cesarean sections. And rest is not. The rest was spontaneous vaginal deliveries. And in the Dhaka Medical College uh, Hospital, there were 60, 60 who came with pain, no cesarean sections, and we did five vacuum extractions. We also did two destructive deliveries on for dead babies. One was a arm prolapse and shoulder presentation and the baby was dead, so we did a um, destructive operation. And the other one was uh, obstructed at seven centimeters with a dead baby, and we did a craniotomy um, to deliver the baby. So, what about perineal care and Yes, so with the vacuum extractor, uh, it's, it doesn't occupy space in the pelvis like forceps do, and it doesn't stretch the perineum on delivery like forceps do. So you just do the episiotomy like you would for a normal delivery if it is necessary. So with a primary gravita, I think it's wise to put local anesthetic in the posterior fourchette so that you're ready for anything. And then as you are delivering the baby, as you are delivering the baby, you are watching, watching, to see if it is stretching the perineum and if it is a rigid perineum and it's holding up the delivery well then you just make a small cut at 60 degrees to complete the delivery 
But you do that for an assisted delivery or for a spontaneous delivery, depending on what's happening at the time of delivery. In case of breach or other presentation, yes. whether you go for or mega So there's no vacuum extraction uh, available for breach, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, breach is a slightly technical obstetrical <laughs> situation, and each case needs to be very carefully assessed to see whether it is suitable for a trial of vaginal uh, labor and delivery, or whether it would be um, uh, better to do an elective cesarean section. So it's an individualized choice based on many obstetrical factors. What about uh, forceps delivery? About so as I said, the forceps, we don't have forceps, but the forceps are these uh, big iron uh, metal things that you put inside, in this way, in this way, like this, on the baby's head, and they occupy some space in the pelvis, but the, but you can't rotate the baby, and you can't flex the head of the baby, and when it's coming to the perineum, if you're not very careful, and you always, always do an episiotomy for forceps, you can't escape an episiotomy with forceps delivery, and even with the episiotomy, if you're not very careful, the forceps as um, can, can rupture the anal sphincter or do other damage to the pelvic floor. So my view is that forceps are obsolete. Obsolete. Yes. So if you read the textbooks, you will read that uh, vacuum extractor should not be used be, um, um, uh, when the baby is less than 35 weeks gestation. <coughs> but my experience is I've never had any problem with a gentle vacuum extraction in conjunction with a pisiotomy for um, a preterm baby. Um, when I was at Kumitola, Kumitola Hospital, we had, uh, we had a case of uh, a woman who had a previous cesarean section and she arrived fully dilated. No antenatal care, so no one knew about the gestation. No one knew she had twins. They thought it was a single baby. And so they asked me to uh, do a demonstration, vacuum extraction for this woman because she'd been in the second stage for one hour. So we went to the labor ward and uh, uh, we drained the bladder because it was full and uh, then the contractions <coughs> were poor so we put some oxytocin and then I examined her and the head was very small and I thought to myself, oh, well, why is this head so small? Anyway, she's fully dilated and she's pushing for one hour. So I put the vacuum extractor on the flexion point and we delivered this little head with the second pull with a physiotomy. Uh, and the baby was one kilo. One kilo, 32 weeks, I think. 32 weeks. So um, we dried the baby and uh, it was in good condition. It started crying in just like one minute, and then they said, oh, doctor, there's another baby. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back, and we delivered the second baby, got some oxy more oxytocin, get the contractions going, rub the membranes. The poor thing was very exhausted, and so I put the vacuum extractor on again, and we delivered the second baby, also one kilo. In the Australian New Zealand Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, I experienced for the last 40 years, 15,000 vacuum extractions and the failure rate was 2.3%. 2.3. Okay. The cord is around the neck. Yes. In the seconds to the bladder. Yes. What we are going to do with that? Nothing. No, there is no problem. Cords around babies are normal. Babies have the cord around the leg, the abdomen, the arm, the neck. Everywhere. The cord is a babies in the 
first, uh, second trimester and the first half of the third trimester, they're doing somersaults, they're playing soccer, they're <laughs> jumping around inside, and they hold their cords. Sometimes they push their cords around their necks. It's normal. I was asked that question by an obstetrician at uh, Shruwadi, is it Shruwadi yes. Hospital. She said, Doctor, um, I, I, I see the cord around the neck on ultrasound, and I, I'm, I'm worried. I said, what are you worried about? She said, oh, it might strangle the baby. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't. Oh, she said, okay. So what should you do? I said, nothing. Don't tell the woman. Hmm? Because if you tell the woman, she will be anxious. And if she is anxious, you are anxious, everybody's anxious, <laughs> you'll be running to the operating theatre. Anxiety leads to cesarean section. <laughs> so don't tell her. It's normal. And then the very next delivery, the very next, after that conversation, about one hour later, we had this poor little woman whom we uh, ripened the cervix yesterday and we'd induced her in the morning and she had an awfully painful labor. We'd given her multiple doses of pethidine to help her get through this labor. And she got to full dilatation and so we decided to assist. So we did the vacuum extraction. The cord was around the neck four times. Baby cried immediately after. And I said to this obstetrician, did you see? Cord was around the neck four times, and the baby cried immediately. Please do not intervene for cord around the neck. It's for post dates, is you wait for 41 weeks, and then after 41 weeks, you might start assessing the situation. Is the placenta okay? Is the baby okay? If the baby's okay, placental function is good, then you go to 42 weeks, still not coming, you do the induction. Yes, with the previous cesarean section, we have the same protocol, but we are very careful with the induction. Often we ripen the cervix with a Foley's catheter and not with prostaglandins. <laughs>